Game Cool Books, Episode 38, Not Just Some Pinball Machine. So, this chapter throws off the symmetry we might have expected. We stick with Will and Lyra, not only for this chapter, but also the next, forming one continuous arc. It's a very interesting one for the student of that theme I tried to bring out back in Chapter 1, the strangeness of the everyday, the sort of magical realism that Pullman blends so skillfully with more overt fantasy elements and his more classically realist ones. How can being with Will and Lyra be more wonderful than being among witches? But of course, they are wonderful characters. And as Will said, they each have their own things to do in Oxford. And so within this long chapter, trepanning, the narration jumps back and forth between them, just as we've jumped between Will's world, the haunted Chitagatsi, to Lyra's world, the narration that is, and now back to Will's. I also love that this chapter harps on chronology a bit, and money too, in a few different ways, and reading and writing, and identity and trust, of course. But alongside those, Time comes up in some interesting ways, and it's something that helps to establish the time period of the story. For instance, when Will uses a public payphone to call the lawyer's office. Apparently, Mr. Perkins sends money every three months, three months, and as Will has a simple question for him, whether his father is alive or dead, and where he might be, he expects a simple answer, but maybe to expect a simple answer from a lawyer is hopelessly naive, and indeed Mr. Perkins comes back with questions which seem calculated to diminish Will's authority. He seems to be seeking ample reasons not to tell Will what he wants to know. He asks him for his age, his location, his mother's state, and his absence from her. And then finally, the phone line itself is an unreliable guarantor of his identity. This all militates irresistibly toward Will uh, being unable to learn what he could have found out in moments by asking Lyra. He invents a reason himself not to visit the office, since the lawyer, based on his suspicion, probably already knows he's wanted by the police or at any rate, he will soon. And that bus that he has to catch to Nottingham uh, lends urgency to his final appeal to the solicitor. And at last, it emerges that he wouldn't have been able to tell Will much anyway because he doesn't know. No one does. About whether his father is alive or dead or where he is. All he can say is that he left instructions to pay out that money from a family trust. That money, it's unclear whether it's inherited or a fortune that uh, John Perry amassed as a Marine. Somehow I doubt that. But then he vanished. And thus Will gets a clue to where to look next. As the lawyer says, it's a matter of public record. And so... If he can find some newspaper stories from the time, which were told us about 10 years ago, he also knows now roughly where John Perry disappeared. He was in the far north, Alaska, rather than Svalbard. The last thing he says is, why don't you... But then he's cut off by that unreliable phone line, the dial tone purred. Uh, cat sound, the way um, the story moved ahead before with help from a cat. In a motif we'll see repeatedly, Will stops himself from dialing his mom. Instead, he writes to her. And that's what the lawyer suggested he do for him, but he does it in a rather different way. Uh, he sends not a uh, formal letter, but a postcard the view of the city. His tender note 
that he holds to him for a minute before putting it in the mailbox, the snail mail, uh, makes him it makes him a parallel uh, to the letters that he still hasn't had a chance to read, those that he committed murder to protect. Then he hides in plain sight. As we're told, he's even proud of his skill, just as Lyra is proud of her lying. Like Serafina Pecola aboard the ship, he becomes part of the background, pretending to be doing a shopping survey while really looking for the public library. Again, as the chapters so far have moved back and forth between worlds and characters there, so this one cuts between Lyra and Will. It's worth paying attention to the differences in the narration that go along with this. And there are certainly more levels to watch for than just the two. Meanwhile, Lyra was looking for somewhere quiet to consult the alethiometer. In her own Oxford, there would have been a dozen places within five minutes' walk, but this Oxford was so disconcertingly different, with patches of poignant familiarity right next to the downright outlandish. Why had they painted those yellow lines on the road? What were those little white patches dotting every sidewalk? In her own world, they had never heard of chewing gum. What could those red and green lights mean at the corner of the road? It was all much harder to read than the alethiometer. So even within there, there's a parenthetical sentence that indicates for us what those white patches are supposed to be, the chewing gum. Um, again, it seems we are uh, assumed to be readers from Will's world. And that's fair because that's the world that we're in as we're reading the book. Um, but somehow we also get to see from Lyra's perception perspective, and it is a perceptive one, um, that last line there, too, that it's much harder to read the alethiometer, I take to be as much as anything letting it be a hint to us to do our best reading here. And, of course, the alethiometer is unusually hard to read here because she has to find somewhere quiet. There are people everywhere in this world. There's also her own memories to contend with. There's shades of Lyra's Jordan, that chapter, in the first book, though Jordan College itself is inexplicably missing. There's a few scenes here that we'd want to go back and add to that imaginary video game of ours for climbing St. John's College gates with Roger to set off fireworks, and that stone at the corner of Cat Street with Simon Parslow's initials, S.P. Ah, uh, we've been told she isn't an imaginative child, but here she is, imagining mysteries like the existence of a doppelganger Lyra in this world, and that makes Pan shiver before she gets back to looking around for a place to read. Her descriptions of the tourists with their cameras as Tartars with little black boxes meekly following their leader, and the strange clothes and diverse appearance of the people, all culminates in a reassuring intuition that they are human, with their demons inside them as Will's was. It's another way in which, as the little prince puts it, it's what's invisible that counts. So, Lyra makes her way through this mock Oxford, judging uh, it and the people in it. Uh, she thinks it's the shop owner's fault for having trouble with her pronunciation of chocolato. And she gets an apple from the covered market, of course. After that comforting familiarity comes another of a kind in the grand building that looks like it could be from her world, though it isn't. Turns out it's a museum, like the Royal Geological that she, in her London with Mrs. Coulter, visited. Here, she finds more things that she knew from other parts of the first book, 
furs and sledges. She thinks it's a picture of the very men who captured her. What were these mysteries? Was there only one world after all, which spent its time dreaming of others? So, in this part, uh, she is reminded of the alethiometer and yet um, doesn't use it for what she had intended at first to uh, read about on it. And it's, in a way, an answer to her dream from that morning, mixing and combining elements of the trick her father played on the scholars and the one she played on the skulls in the crypt for she comes to a case of trepanned human skulls. The told spidery writing on a card says one thing about their age, but the alethiometer tells another true story. There's considerably more forthcoming than uh, it was about her dream when she asked. The alethiometer tells her this time just how ancient the skull with two holes in it is. 33,000 years old, or rather, 33,254 years, that's, that's the exact amount, um, and that the purpose, as Lee Scoresby said, was to let the gods into their head. This puts the consciousness of the divine penetrating human consciousness at a particular point in history, a significant data point, as we'll learn. And here the image of dusty light shining on Lyra echoes visibly for us the invisible process of questioning and learning that's going on between Lyra and the skulls and the alethiometer. Something else going on here is that she is being watched, all unaware, just as we, in turn, are privy to the Watcher. We see him described twice. First, in full realism, we have the Panama hat, the forehead, the tongue, the hothouse plants, so you can smell the decay. That second person touch in that last bit of the description that you can smell and the connotations of those details, the snowy handkerchief, for example, emphasize how creepy his interest in her is. We're told more than once that he notices her bare arms, bare leg. And then mops that forehead of his. Um, then That curious distinction between children and adults gets brought to our attention in another way as Lyra learns that there is more dust around the trepan skull than the one that was killed with an arrowhead. As we know, there's more dust around adults than children, and that has to do with the quality of their attention. Then. She notices the old man beside her, and he finally becomes aware of her, we're told. Her description of him, or the one we get through her perspective, is much simpler than the narrator's omniscient one, but crucially it adds one thing, that he reminded her of someone. He strikes up a conversation which emphasizes her youth, talking about hippies, which she wouldn't remember. But he also toys with her, since hippies didn't exist in their world anyway, as far as we know. Thinking how to get away, for he's already violating her personal space, his hand brushing hers over the case, he manages to keep her in the conversation by saying that he comes there a lot. And could that 
be? Where his window is hidden? Somewhere in the museum? Could he even be responsible for having brought some of the specimens that she recognized through from their world? Or maybe that's pushing too much on the literal read of her recognition. Anyhow, she's puzzled by him. The opposites meeting in him. Pan, too, is half-remembering, begs her to be careful, just as they promised that they would after the catastrophe with Roger. She thinks of the idea of a smell, Yofor Rachnison's perfumed house of tinsel and mockery, to recall Yorick's verdict, and that makes a damning reflection on this mock Oxford. What foulness! its prosperity conceals, just like the man in the Panama hat. And it contrasts, too, with the smell of glamour, which she felt so powerfully and innocently in Mrs. Coulter's presence. Lyra's lies here are feebler than we might expect from her, but seemingly it gets put into her head by this old man's offer to go and meet someone who's had trepanning done. But that tongue, quick as a snake's, helps her resist the kind offer. It telegraphs the temptation, the danger. And she says she's going to meet the friend she's staying with instead. But just in case, as he puts it, gives her his card. Into her rucksack it goes, right beside the alethiometer. Outside again in the park, which is a field for cricket in her world, she finally asks for a scholar who would know about dust, and it directs her at once. But then, sensing its moods now, she hears much more that she hadn't asked about, that she must concern herself with the boy and help him find his father. If this is startling to her, it's a lot like us opening this book and finding a totally different character in chapter one. Um, it implies a revaluation of her entire story and his and their relative importance. What's still more difficult, it instructs her, do not lie to the scholar. So awkward and defiant, just as the reader probably feels, she goes, recognizing better than she does, though, how much danger she was just in. Perhaps I feel bound to mention here that in the Demon Voices uh, essay collection, there is a mention of an author that Pullman admired until he found out more about that author's uh, predatory uh, behavior. So I don't know whether that was part of the inspiration for the scene or whether that's just a coincidence that he came across later. Back to Will, our wholesome murderer, or at least manslaughterer, He's found his library, and there we get another piece of recently outmoded technology, a microfilm reader, where the librarian helps him pull up the times index for the year of his birth and of his father's disappearance. The projector he reads on is like Lord Asriel's again in the retiring room, and like Lord Asriel's expedition, his father's was funded by the university, the Institute of Archaeology of his world. Their purpose to look for evidence of early human settlements. Huh, just what Lyra was discovering. And they got lost um, in Noatak, Alaska, or somewhere near it. We get a rough timeline, month by month. The year will even be revealed soon. But the search flights, the interviews with relatives, including a picture of his own mother and himself as a baby, are all disappointingly short of actual facts for Will's liking. 
he's left baffled. It's quite different from Lyra's mode of research. Um, although sort of a similar outcome, I guess. Which might make us wonder, is Lyra too being traced? Just as he fears that he will be, based on what he asks about and reads about in the library. This is a major concern of Pullman as the champion of the reader's freedom. It might be more accurate to say at this point that Lyra is being not traced, but being guided by her reading of the alethiometer. And St. Peter's, that school that Will says he's from, is probably just a random name, but it does connote that stone at the corner of Cat Street that Lyra found so mysterious. S.P., Simon Peter, maybe. And in another of Pullman's little jokes on the jargon of modern education, Will deploys a wonderful phrase here. My class is doing a sort of residential field trip, kind of environmental study research skills. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, boy. Meanwhile, Lara has another flash of familiarity as she's confronted with the Porter's Challenge in the physics building. And she feels Pan enjoying himself. She revels in lying while she can. Her art here consists in the usual features, a germ of truth, as she reads a name off the wall, and then a gradual accretion of plausible details, and then her own innocence, the clincher, her convincing pretense of knowledge, knowing Will's world, we're told, in some ways better than he does. So she sees on her way up scholars talking at a blackboard and the Spartan furnishings. So it's a difference in style and a kind of difference in language too that uh, impresses upon her here. Rather than dust, the door is marked dark matter research. So we're brought back to that line of Milton, although he's not one of the ones mentioned here. Instead we get R.I.P., which we should know from the crypt, and then in another hand, Director Lazarus. If the first joke, the R.I.P., is that the research unit is dead, the second, the rejoinder, is that it is raised from the dead. But Lyra makes nothing of all this. So these jokes and these examples of writing are just not that interesting to her anymore than she can make of the impression that meets her once inside. A room crowded with equipment and equations, all sorts of information beyond her, including a Chinese diagram on the back of the door itself. So it mirrors the jokes scrawled out on the front. We'll learn much more about this I Ching but a very important new character is introduced at this point, too. Apparently, Dr. Malone was actually written out of the stage adaptations of the story. And that's really a shame, I think, because she forms a really important contrast uh, with, for one thing, the uh, uh, female scholars that Lyra was so dismissive of before, and that she'll reunite with at the very end of the story. But also, of course, she'll play the serpent uh, towards the end. And we've just met the character, Charles, aka Lord Boreal, who represents a kind of uh, evil uh, version of that same uh, archetypal figure. Now, uh, this time Lyra forbears judgment of finding a female scholar. This is, after all, a strange world. Her impression of the computer is a marvelous contrast to the alethiometer, which will be making its appearance again soon. She sees an engine with 
letters of the alphabet laid out on grimy blocks and tray. To the scholar's question, of course, who are you? She obeys the oethiometer and tells the truth with much effort. The woman is described as a little older than Mrs. Coulter, with red cheeks, wearing jeans, those canvas slacks that everyone wears in this world. She calls Lyra the second unexpected thing that's happened. And it's a play on all the doubling that goes on in this chapter. She introduces herself as Dr. Mary Malone. So her name recalls, of course, the Virgin Mary and aloneness. Both of these qualities more or less will be brought out later. As expected, the word dust means nothing to her, so Lyra has to explain. You might not call it that. It's elementary particles. In my world, the scholars call it Rusakov particles, but normally they call it dust. They don't show up easily, but they come out of space and fix on people. Not children so much, though. Mostly on grown-ups. And something I only found out today, I was in that museum down the road, and there were some old skulls with holes in their heads, like the Tartars make. And there was a lot more dust around them than around this other one that hadn't got that sort of hole in. When's the Bronze Age? So, turns out the Bronze Age is far too recent to come up to the actual age of that central skull. 33,000 years old, hearing which Mary looks like she's about to faint. Her questions spill out. She asks who, no where, and then what, and then how, and Lyra sighed, for a lie would be so much easier for the scholar to understand. Of course, another world doesn't make sense to say she's from, so she goes with that vague somewhere else, the same answer that she gave to Angelica. And trying to explain dust again, this time as original sin, she refers to her father and then abruptly, no, she stamps her foot. So the other world that she had promised to Will that she would not give away. And her bruises and emotion elicit Dr. Malone's sympathy here. So even though Lyra isn't fully able to answer her questions, she calms her down and asks herself now, why is she listening to all this? She must be crazy. She puts it, this was the only place she might have gotten an answer, but they're about to be closed down. And she seems overwhelmed. It's too much. Just like Will's and Lyra's varieties of overwhelm from the last chapter. She speaks of the funding committee. Maybe that was the first unexpected thing that happened? No, it was someone who withdrew his support. Who could that be? Maybe this is one of the stray threads that Pullman had in mind to write short stories about in the day. Curious about those I Ching symbols, Lyra detects sarcasm in Malone's answer. Then they come to the crux of dark matter. It becomes a reset in the conversation as Dr. Malone pulls out a chair for Lyra gets up to get her some coffee and biscuits. Her explanation is rather different from Lyra's of dust, naturally. Dark matter is what my research team is looking for. No one knows what it is. There's more stuff out there in the universe than we can see. That's the point. We can see the stars and the galaxies and the things that shine, but for it all to hang together and not fly apart, there needs to be a lot more of it to make gravity work, you see. But no one can detect it. So there are lots of different research projects trying to find out what it is, and this is one of them. Lyra was all focused attention. At last, the woman was talking seriously. So in that telling, gravity becomes the thing that holds things together, uh, but only a sort of epiphenomenon of dust. 
Either way, it works as a kind of metaphor for meaning or in the uh, medieval conception for love, cosmic uh, order. Now, she asks if Lyra knows anything about physics, and Pan warns her, so she's not able to directly lie about her education, but she, of course, can't tell the whole truth. She knows a little bit, she says, which comes out humble enough. Um, you know that she'll know more than anyone about Dustin. Maybe she already does. But instead of uh, searching like the other teams, their strategy, it seems, is to put their detectors deep underground. Another place Lyra will eventually go. And they use an electromagnetic field to amplify uh, the readings and screen out what they don't want, run that through their computer. So maybe that whole lovely uh, exchange about amber and electrum in the previous chapter was in some sense a setup for this much more mundane use of the term. Um, so this is sort of what Mary Malone asked. Why is she saying all this? Why, when this is so strange, she feels crazy and again yawns with exhaustion. Our particles are strange little devils, make no mistake. We call them shadow particles, shadows. You know what nearly knocked me off of my chair next now when you mentioned the skulls in the museum. Because one of our team, you see, is a bit of an amateur archaeologist, and he discovered something one day that we couldn't believe. But we couldn't ignore it because it fitted in with the craziest thing of all about these shadows. You know what? They are conscious. That's right. Shadows are particles of consciousness. You ever heard anything so stupid? No wonder we can't get our grant renewed. She sipped her coffee. Lyra was drinking in every word like a thirsty flower. I think there is a simile, if not that exact one, and something very similar that Pullman uses in his discussions of education about students' need of stories. And then she refines her formulation a bit that you can't see them unless you expect to. And then she finds she's looking for a scrap on which someone had written with green pen. She read, capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. You have to get into that state of mind. That's from the poet Keats, by the way. I found it the other day. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe that writer with the green pen was Pullman himself. We know that objects find their way between the worlds in Lyra's Oxford. Pullman's avowed interest in Keats from his autobiographical sketch. It can be found via the Internet Archive. Anyway, to the I, sorry, the I Ching and Keats' negative capability, we can also add shadows on the wall of the cave in Plato's Republic. That was her colleague again, who's off to Geneva and associated thus with the magisterium, with the oppressive power of the intellect. Recall that the Republic's city in speech is far from a champion of freedom of expression, so much so that it has inspired many defenses of poetry through the years. So the shadows in that metaphor are cast by deceivers, and it's only out in the light of the sun that truth abides. Anyhow, another simile from the Theotetus more congenial to freedom when she says the way that the shadows respond is that they flock to your thinking like birds. About that colleague of hers, the third time he's mentioned, you get his name, Oliver Payne. And 
she keeps coming back to him. It's almost like they have some further connection, although that's never really uh, explained. Anyhow, he's messing around testing things, like a lump of ivory versus a chess piece, a splinter versus a ruler, and a carved statue, it turns out, has more than either. So the cutoff point, this comes back to the skulls, is around the time modern humans appear at that age of 30 to 40,000 years ago. Of course, Lyra has known about this property of dust ever since she hid in the retiring room and saw Lord Asriel's photographs. She says simply, it's dust. That's what it is. And she's unperturbed by Mary's angst that such a thing cannot exist. It's impossible. It's irrelevant. And if neither of those, it's embarrassing. And so Lyra asks to see the cave. And this is yet another meaning of the word to see. When you say it in that sense, and Mary Malone doesn't get this at first, you don't mean just get to see it with your eyes, right? How it's glowing and empty and gray, how there's all these electrodes for reading brain waves. But when she says, let me see it, it's like asking for a, a toy or to, to get to hold, to get to see it uh, and get to know it in that sense. Um, Lyra insists she knows what she's doing, and Mary says, I wish I did. <laughs> she <laughs> says, you can't just come in here and have a go like a pinball machine. But it was precisely through such serious play that she and her colleague learned about the chess piece and the time cut off, and that Lyra found her way into the retiring room and learned everything that she did. Since then, she remembers she needs to tell the truth. That word aletheia, Father Quorum taught us, means truth. And she brings out the aletheometer. Mary Malone is struck by the weight of it. It's cold, this work of art, which does what her cave does. It brings together the test subjects, and the testing equipment, so to speak. It's a fortune-telling game they're playing now. They're, Lyra is much more honest about this time than when she tricked Yofor. And so it's more like the scene at the witch consul's house, actually. She demands that Mary ask her a question. And eventually she does. She asks what she was doing before she got into this line of work. We get the full story much later, when she's playing the serpent, and she is, in this case, tempted by Eve. It's a reversal. Um, but for now, we just learn that she used to be a nun, which is a shock to Lyra, of course, from her world, where such a thing could never happen, a nun leaving the convent. And yet again, we get that image of dreaming. Um, Mary says she must be dreaming. If so, it's like Lyra at the start of the previous chapter. It's like uh, Lyra's insight about uh, worlds dreaming and like being in someone else's dream. Um, Mary says, let's carry on. So, that electrical hum that comes in reminds Lyra of the sound of Bolvanger with its silver guillotine. She takes comfort in Pan's presence, which is still something she hasn't been fully forthcoming about. The wires might make us think, too, of Lord Azrael with Roger. For all these ominous warnings or hints, once Lyra is all hooked up, and the room is full of shadows, we get one more, maybe a little more of a stretch, but it's still, I think, the reference is here to the glass darkly of Corinthians. She sees her reflection in the cave. The experiment that she goes with is to pretend 
that she's asking the alethiometer. What does this person know? What is she asking? And so it's much like Father Quorum's final question for Dr. Lancelius. What question should I ask you, essentially? There's another interesting thing going on in their sort of mutual unawareness here. Mary is unaware of Lyra's fear in her excitement, uh, and Lyra is unaware of that excitement um, as she's so focused on her reading and her questioning. We get the image of the curtains of the aurora and the, the display, and recall that that's what Roger saw in Lyra's reading of the alethiometer after Yorick's combat. There was that flock of birds again um, from the time that she was beginning to read. She felt the same sense as of trembling on the brink of understanding. Um, so it's like learning to read the alethiometer all over again. It's like learning to think in a new way, although, of course, she's using the way that she has learned already. There's uh, the, uh, the question that she asks now, is this dust? And she takes the display of light and color as a yes. And maybe that's the only way in which such a question can be answered. In some sense, the entire story is a process of answering that question about the nature of dust. It can't be done discursively, but only through this kind of performance, perhaps. Anyway, Mary is astonished. She asks, what were you doing? <laughs> and Lyra says, it could be even clearer than that. Um, they seem to be a little bit at cross purposes here. For Lyra, it is like reading a message. For Mary Malone, it's something else. Uh, Lyra says that it could be able to make pictures, the symbols that she's used to using. And she shows her, imagining the candle for understanding, the alpha and omega for language, the ant for diligence. We don't get a symbol that's necessarily about the shadows themselves or these people um, that she's asking about. But then the response comes, and this is the first time we have heard such a thing in a while, getting the exact symbols that the response comes in. The compasses, alpha and omega, lightning, angel, camel, garden, moon. <laughs> when Mary Malone sees that, she herself becomes white-faced. So, some interesting things going on here with the language. Lyra's language is pictures, that medium that Pullman so greatly admires. And it could be made to use words, she says. That's the medium, of course, that Pullman is so masterful at. She interprets the compasses as a lot of clever figuring with numbers, the lightning for electric power. She uses that language carefully. The angel for messages, which of course is the root meaning of that word. And then the other three she takes to be pointing her towards Asia, almost the farthest east. And maybe it's the garden that makes her think it's a way of talking using sticks. She realizes now that there's lots of ways of communicating with shadows, lots of different languages under that umbrella mode of thinking, of which poetry itself is one, according to Keats. And somehow, um, all of this exhilaration turns to uh, exhaustion, despair, even regret on Mary Malone's part. She demands, this time, to know where Lyra is from. So there's a bit more about 
Lyra's understanding of what she's doing now, that she's run away from her world, from people who want to kill her, that the alethiometer she got from the master, she learned to read by herself, that there's doubts and mysteries that she intuitively understands how to manage. And then she puts it away again. A mother protecting her child. The same image we saw with Serafina Pecola and the lost demon. The tipping point seemed to be Lyra telling Mary Malone that she was important too, according to the dust, the shadows, and that somehow the I Ching is much more than just decoration. It seems that Mary might even have intuited that herself, but she's not uh, willing to accept it at this point. She has this problem with talking about good and evil in a scientific laboratory, but that's Lyra's fundamental question of all the things she might want to know about dust. Why do they hate it so much, the church people in her world? Uh, Lord Asriel, for that matter, according to what he said to Mrs. Coulter, anyway. Why do they want to destroy it? Um, of course, Dr. Malone has had a taste of this herself. As she puts it, it's too embarrassing. Uh, it's not serious science. It won't be something that she can put in a funding application. And that's all sort of a superficial way of saying the same thing, that there is some problem here that no one is quite able or willing to state clearly. And Lyra is the most honest about this, saying that you have to think about these things and that you can't refuse. If you're important, you have to do something, uh, some part to play in all this. Apparently, her lithiometer, uh, like a... Uh, unsatisfactory housemaid will not tell Lyra, the haughty duchess, quite what she wants to know. Maybe if she asks about dust, it, its answer is uh, something like that flurry of light and color, something still beyond her ability to read, or in some inscrutable way, like its answer about her dream, it uh, doesn't fully uh, respond to her question. There's a kind of urgency now, as Dr. Malone has tonight, to figure out how to get uh, words on the screen so she can understand the shadows. And that is, of course, not what the alethiometer had told Lyra <laughs> for her to focus on but to help the boy. Um, maybe these shadows are different from the dust that uh, directs the alethiometer's hands, and, or if they're the same, then in some fashion, this process will actually help what she and it directs her that she needs to actually do. While she's leaving, she promises to come back tomorrow um, to show someone else. And if it's a trap, it's too late. She's given her word. And she does what she says. So one last time, we jump back over to Will, who's been directed by the librarian to the Institute of Archaeology. And he's hearing about the Nuniatak dig. He is the second person in a month, so kind of like that second unexpected thing that happened to Mary Malone today. To ask about it, a journalist was the other one, the man thinks, but how different from the journalists that Will has just been reading, or from that one that Lyra met at the cocktail party, though like Adele Starminster, this so-called journalist was an intruder. He was asking about one of the men on the expedition, which took place during the Cold War. We're told Star Wars. Again, 
this politics is a kind of background, like that high political tension about Tartar invasions back at the beginning of the whole story. Maybe it's possible that something going on in this expedition could have led to that very high political tension in Lyra's world. Who knows? Um, anyhow, Will's too young to remember all that, just as Lyra was too young to know about hippies. And oddly enough, it's always the recent and more immediately relevant history that seems to get left out of classes at school, even for those of us who do go to school. Uh, the Americans and Russians building in the Arctic is his gloss on Star Wars. But it's also, of course, a zeitgeist-shaped movie, blockbuster. And Will just says that he was curious after reading about something else. Again, I think the story is modeling for us here what real passionate curiosity and learning should look like. But, of course, the other side of that is also showing us how dangerous they are. Now, conveniently, the archaeologist just looked all this up for the so-called journalist, and so he's able to rattle off some more information for Will and us that this was a preliminary uh, expedition to see if it would be worth spending time on a full dig and money. They split the cost with different fields. Um, there's a physicist looking at the aurora. There's balloons. There's an ex-marine to fend off polar bears. <laughs> Maybe this is another joke between the narrator and us. Um, and also, of course, he would be there to navigate, to make camp, all that sort of survival stuff. Now, the actual disappearance, apparently, all he can tell us about it is that there was a signal that didn't come one day. That's an interesting kind of signal. It was after a blizzard, but that's nothing unusual around there. When the searchers came upon the camp, they found it intact except for the bears having eaten some of the stores. Now that makes it sound a little bit like the world of Chittagatse, which would put the children in the place of the bears. And I would contend that Will is a very good stand-in, actually, for Yorick Birnison here. Now, he asks at this point, which one was it that the journalist was interested in? The explorer chap. And then he asks an even stranger question. What did he look like? journalist. And he can't really think of a reason why he would ask that. Uh, more's the pity. But Will's been doing a lot of quick thinking today. He lets this one get by him, unfortunately. And we learned that the journalist was a big blonde man. Will recognizes by that pale hair by that uncanniness of pallor, again, that this was no journalist. As he's leaving, he sees the archaeologist le uh, reaching for the phone, just the way this chapter opened. Uh, but in this little interlude, we see Will finally sort of wrestling with the uh, killing that he committed. He takes cover in an art gallery. And I find that to be a very moving sort of metaphor uh, to deal with suffering, to deal with the evil that we're capable of. We can take refuge in art, literally here. Um, it has to do with time, too, in the sense that you can put this off only so long before it closes in. And when it does, you'll spend one of the worst half hours, at least, I would think, ever. But in that time, he finally calms down as he wrestles with the horror of what he's done. He calms down by thinking of his mother, of course, he was defending her. He was defending his home, and he has a right to that as well. He even goes so far as to call it a good thing to do, because
because he has to find his father, and to do so, he has to protect and understand what's in the green leather writing case. And of course, he has a right to find uh, the truth, ultimately. You know, uh, more than these uh, rationalizations, though, I think it's the imagination that comes to his aid here. Those childish games of his came back to him. And he says in his mind that he'll find his father. He says, I'll find you. So there's that second person, the immediacy again. He takes heart in knowing that the papers are safe in the other world. And that gives us a pretty clear indication of what he's planning to do next, uh, at long last. Um, all of these examples of reading and writing that we see throughout this chapter will finally culminate in reading those letters. Meanwhile, people are moving purposefully. Actually, this sounds kind of weirdly like the streams of dust that Mary Malone will see at the very end of the series. Um, moving purposefully. But in this case, Will has to go with them or else he'll be caught. And he nearly is outside the lawyer's office. He finds himself almost heading in before seeing that man with the pale eyebrows going in. He sees him in the reflection in the window. It's like Lyra saw her face in the reflection of the cave. And uh, with that, this portion of our tour of Oxford will have to come to an end. Um, there, of course, is a lot of reading that might go well with this chapter, but um, I'll put a link to the Keats letter in particular to highlight. Um, there's also a fairly excellent um, part of Laurie Frost's uh, encyclopedia where she gives some kind of walking maps of this day that Lyra and Will spend together in Oxford, or rather apart, and then they come back together. Um, there's a pretty strong indication that the museum that Lyra visits is the Pitt Rivers, and that Will visits is the Ashmolean. Um, I guess we'll have to ask someone who actually lives there, or who at least uh, knows about these places to give us some more insight on that. So hopefully we'll get a chance before too long. Thanks again for listening. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. 